Welcome everyone. We just finished our course on Heidegger on technocracy and being human in our technocratic technological age. And as always, we finished with a present a round of presentations with the pro seminar where participants presented their papers and their talks and those of them who were open to being published on YouTube on my channel here. You can listen to their talks um, in this video. I'm very grateful to everyone involved in the course and thank you all so much for your contribution. I just say it here publicly now once more. I've had a tremendous time again. It's, I, it's me who's learning and I'm grateful that I've been able to build what I've been building for the past two years, thanks to you and everyone else who's been involved with my courses. So I hope all of you out there, whoever stumbles upon uh, this video, enjoys the talks as well. You see how extremely thoughtful they are and also how uh, diverse. Um, you'll see that also someone is performing a song which was written specifically for this course as a commentary on electricity and our electric atomic age. So enjoy the talks. Leave a comment if you'd like to know more and get in touch um, with me or so about any of the future courses. I'll let you know how you can do that. So thank you very much. Jack. Do you, would you mind going first? Is that okay? Johannes, of course. No, I don't mind because <laughs> we're all in the midst of it. We're all in the midst of our drafts. So <laughs> here we go. So I wanted to really, I wrote my essay. I bit off more than I can chew, but I really wanted to go back to the beginnings of, of, of Heidegger and my, my attempts, continuing attempts to understand him. And so I'm, the title of my essay is Situating Heidegger's Thought and Phenomenology. And it's in uh, six parts. They're short, they're about, my essay is about as long as the ones that came before. So number one, the two-sided problem and solution. Heidegger's thought throughout his philosophical writings is nearly universally regarded as difficult and even obscure. Even among Heidegger's scholars, misinterpretations and missed interpretations are not uncommon. In this essay, I submit that one reason for the struggle to understand Heidegger's thought stems in part and from the outset from the inability to situate his ideas within an existing frame of understanding, a frame that need not and should not and frame Heidegger's thought, but rather serve as a starting point from which students of Heidegger can follow him in the unfolding of his thought. To fail to situate his thought in what is understood is one source of misunderstanding. Another is to remain situated in that frame and bend Heidegger's thought to it rather than to proceed out from it. One way to fall into this latter trap is to bring his new inceptual thought into pre-existing metaphysical concepts. Thus, I propose that better understandings of Heideggerian thought requires a two-step process. First, to begin from what is known and then to gently but incessantly rethink it, to open oneself to Heidegger's inceptual thinking, his second philosophical beginning. I submit that the starting point to situate Heidegger's thought is to start with the phenomena, that is, from what is available to human conscious experience and to proceed to phenomenology, that is to the science of phenomena, the making sense of articulating and interpreting the phenomena through thought, when based, of course, in language. Heidegger tells us as much when he inserts Husserl's imperative to the things themselves into being in time, explaining, quote, with the question of being, our investigation comes up against the fundamental question of philosophy, this is one that must be treated phenomenologically, end quote. If we remain ensconced in phenomena, however, we remain at risk of misinterpreting Heidegger once again by keeping ontic what he makes ontological. 
In such a case, Heidegger's thought can then be understood as a psychology or anthropology. Although his ideas can enrich these other fields of study, they, his ideas, are not of these fields. Heidegger instead incorporates a second methodology into his way of thought, and that is hermeneutics, quintessentially an interpretive science. Thus in short, Heidegger begins with phenomena and proceeds to interpret them, building a new ontology, one based on ontic experience, but then somehow abstracted and universalized from it. It is worth reminding ourselves that Heidegger was an accomplished Husserlian. He spent years learning the phenomenological methods of epoche and phenomenological reduction and doing so from their originator, Edmund Husserl. Two, phenomena. To gain a stance to what I have presented so far, I ask you to imagine to experience the following scene. You sit at home near the fire place, there near, the fire burns itself out. Embers glow. In your kitchen, meat roasts in the oven and potatoes boil on the stove. On the table, your coffee grows cold. Outside, here and now, it is spring time. The first green shoots break through the ground. The first buds open. Above, clouds approach and the rain begins to fall. Upstairs, the child sleeps and dreams and grows. And you think that one day the child will leave this place, continue to sleep and dream, and, and often not think of you as that child stays in your thoughts and away. How uncanny and how mysterious. The flagrancy of pre 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 presencing here all around and flowing across the realm of time. All things showing themselves from themselves, glimmering with an inner light, manifesting their own way of being, each being unfolding in truth within their own unencumbered space and time. Number three, being. Now let's rest and gather and ask a series of questions, which is just one question. What burns the fire, glows the embers, roasts the meat, boils the potatoes, grows your coffee cold? What makes the clouds approach you and begins the rain to fall? What breaks the green shoots through the ground and opens the first buds? What makes the child sleep and dream and grow? What brings forth your thinking of one future day and the realization of the frequent absence on that one day of your child's thoughts of you? An initial flash, an answer comes to mind. It is being, being does all of the above. Yes and no. No way of thinking is ever complete in its own one way. Further questions come. If it is being, then what is being? Is it a force that moves, unfolds everything, that makes the river flow? Is it a force? If so, does that force force everything to its own way? Does it choose which buds open first and which wait for tomorrow? Is being another word for God? The answer is this. Being can be experienced in the ways above and often is. But consider now again in your experience, does being force all things into its own way, preordained, preconceived, following one path through every moment's unfolding, thus eliminating all freedom, all possibility, all creativity? Heidegger considered and rejected this understanding. He disparagingly called this kind of God a slave driver. Is being then what all things and all their unfoldings have in common? If so, what would that be? If you arrive at an answer of what use would that answer be? To make of being what is universal is to perhaps say little. And after all, these answers have all been presented in their representations before for over 2,000 years. 
that is metaphysics. This is being as veneer that covers all, as Heidegger said. So some possible understandings have been considered and rejected. The answer, one that will attune with the tuning silence, the Geläute der Stille, is more elusive than it might otherwise be because of language. In English, we are at disadvantage. We lack a middle voice, one that is neither active nor passive, that denotes neither an agent acting nor a patient acted upon. Because we lack the middle voice as written in English, being often sounds like an agent, as a being, uh, as a being, um, as an entity undertaking an action. As an agent, being then sounds like an intelligent, intentional agent. It thus sounds like God in all but name. But this is a contingency born of our particular language. My vignette above was written to suggest instead a self unfolding one that does not engage cause nor agency, being unfolds. Entities arise into presence, abide and fall away. Heidegger eschews uh, the traps of reducing beings and their being to causal and logical concept formation. Relatedly, in English, we frequently also lack self-reflexivity when speaking of non-agents. We can say, I moved myself out of the way, but not the clouds move themselves towards me. One exception included in my scene above is the fire burns itself out. This example conveys that a self-reflective change or, or unfolding does not imply agency, intelligence, or, or intentionality. There is no homunculus in the cloud steering them towards a destination. In contradistinction to English, in other languages, it can be said, sometimes it must be said, that clouds near themselves to me, that the coffee cools itself, and that the buds open themselves. Thus, Heidegger, when translated from German to English, that only lo loses nuance of German as a centuries old spoken language, but gains non-intended connotations, such as of self-directedness that can take the unwary reader far down different thinking paths. Four, concealment and the abyss. Something more is needed to comport Heidegger's ideas to our experience. In the scene presented above, did you notice silence, the space between the things, time unfolding and giving room for things to unfold themselves, the distance between the day of thought and the day of its focus, bringing the not yet into the now? These are just some small examples of how being conceals itself. In fact, concealment is the natural state of being. To come to know and make sense of beings and being itself, Humans must unconceal beings and being through uncovering them as aletheia. Being does not make this unconcealing easy. It hides in the very act of appearing, hiding itself in the appearance of things that appear in their unconcealment. But there is more, always more lurking behind the eye of experience. Despite this difficulty presented us by being, Many aspects of concealed being remain available to our unconcealment. At the very same time, there are other aspects that forever remain beyond our ken, beyond our ability to make meaningful. This beyondness Heidegger, Heidegger calls the abyss, the ab, abgrund. The abyss is a gift of being. Being, through its concealment, its ceaseless withdrawing and giving way gives everything the space to unfold and the time to unfold. The abyss holds beings, but holds them in a way that allows their being each in its own way to be and to show. What is the way for humans? 
It is the way of existence, to exist in openness to and engagement with being, a way that allows the human to be unknown by being, to partake in aragnas, to be the site of the clearing. It means to experience the phenomena as the things themselves, rather than as mere appearances, as designated pre-ontologized representations, representations that eschew partaking in the experience of the showing of things from themselves. Thus, it is the abyss of being unfathomable and unrepresentable that gifts this openness in which freedom, decision, and creativity obtain. It allows humans to be unknown in the event of order. I mean, sorry, it allows humans to be unknown in the, in, in the event in order to come into their own authentic being. Five, this essay. This essay is an instantiation of the Seinsfrage approach through my experiencing and questioning of being. This essay in its nature is premature because I know little of Heidegger. It is temporary because my thought has already moved beyond it the moment I completed it. And it is inadequate because of my own failing, but also because all attempts are in their own way inadequate. They all fall, all fall short. It may make little sense to wonder if some attempts fall more short than others. They all fall short, as they must. It is the nature of human being that being eludes us, as it is the nature of being that it hides itself. Its hiding of being remains hidden because the hiding itself is hidden. The concealment is, its, is, is itself concealed. As presented by the abyss, much of what is concealed forever remains beyond our ken. At most, the human can unconceal the concealedness. To know of the existence of the withdrawn and hidden aspect of being of the unknowable abyss and of the nothingness beyond all else. To know it is there, forever there and forever beyond reach. It means living with a living sense of mystery and all, a way of living with and within the signs fraga, instantiating in, one, in one's own day-to-day -day life, attendance to and questioning of being in its knowable and unknowable aspects. Although Heidegger often referred to his thinking path, the, uh, the Denkweg, I submit that for us, it helps to think of the experiencing and thinking path, thus situating as the starting point, our own phenomenological experience, while, the, while at the same time, knowing the need to proceed from out of it. This essay is thus the outcome of my dwelling and thought of being. Out and come are Anglo-Saxon words that in Latin are ex and venida. Out and come, exactly. The event is the outcome. As an outcome, an event is the coming out into manifestness. Beings being in their own way of being, each in their own way gathered together in an unrepeatable meeting and mutual unfolding, coming out to be unknown by being as sites of being and partaking in being itself. This is Aragnes. The end. Thank you, Jack. Excellent. Thank you very much. And please do send me that essay as well, just like last time. Also, I'd like to read it again. Thank you, Jack. There's usually a high point when Czech gives a speech, so we have, we started very high this time. <laughs> Mike. If you want to read along, Mike shared his text in the chat. Mm -hmm. It's also on Discord if you want to uh, access it later. So um, I've been writing a novel, a uh, epistolary novel about... Um, what the ontological implications would be if time travel had indeed started occurring. And um, it's told as a series of film introductions by a um, film programmer who is actually trying to start a doomsday cult. 
And rather than uh, read any one introduction, I cobbled together um, sections that were relevant to some of what we've discussed. So here we go. As the noonday demon can't be exercised by the clocksmith, as darkness visible becomes darkness risable, as a sun glimpsed is no clipped by monolith, here's wishing you all a magnificent midday. Welcome steersmen, welcome to friends and enemies at dusk, welcome thieves. Let us remind any non-visible cephalopods or brain invaders eager of arrival that humanity's linguistic encoding of time as tense and aspect has been thus far adaptive. It's been a good time. The imperfective paradox is no paradox at all. Our temporal logic operators operate just fine for now. Our ontological primitives bang their bones obscenely as apes pre-thinking before the club, apes stinking beyond the infinite. Eeps on the cusp of a truth they cannot unthrow. For now, a Byzantine power lets us dwell beneath the tree of life in the early days of heavenly deray, when white shone through elemental red, precipitating all this entropic ease of motion, started by just what, exactly? All these balls of light can't mirror the human eye so coincidentally, can they? All this billowing, all these angry red sparks of mobile matter, all that emerged from blackness, all these vaginal prisms of life itself once it all began, surrounded by stars that enveloped planet formations and gaseous clouds, and onto recognizable cloud patterns and mountain ranges and in through the chasms of volcanic rage while shun, sun shines plain upon it all. All these origins of each far and each near, all of these origins in cross light, all these old seekings of maximum resolution that Lubeski's short focal length brings to Sinosphere. Temba at rest, yet there's free Landerian reason for fear, long before end-time zombies arrear and reappear, shot reverse shot. The signs in Pawneepool, an hour northeast of here, east of Uxbridge and Port Perry, north of Orono, north even of Lescar, no longer possess purpose. The needlessly named bridges are damaged. When bridges fail, we plummet into icy depths of semantic darkness. These depths refresh the swimmer, capable as Bert Lancaster, or bored as the graduate, though they serve a bitter draft to the sustaining spirit of the times. Commercial time sculptors fail to redeem civically engineered decay. They only authenticate its aesthetic such that all criticism is abridged into the transhumane decadence market. Consider tonight's sponsor, the ironic OMG Muffin Spa's offer to spoil you in our decadent muffin spa equipped with three to the power of 13 unique muffin stations, muffin brain interfaces, monkey muffins who drive Teslas with their minds, muffin masseuses who give hand jobs because they've lost their way in life, muffin meat loaves, muffins with neocortexes connected to the cloud, muffin poutines that aren't meat to be enjoyed but rather tweeted of, Darkly Enlightened Muffins, Bad Boy Muffins, James from Twin Peaks Muffins, Crisp Beer Muffins, their genetic crunch deficiencies reified at birth. Muffins who are the children of a vanquished revolution, when obviously the word decadence derives from decay. Our sponsor's value proposition, come deteriorate and its accelerationist muffinage well aware of its own assignation in our muffin den of a trophic ruin. Temporal artifice is not nascent. Every article of impeachment or pornographic prowl on the PSVR only represents something that was. Every event and argument has always been banal as its antecedent. Cesare, the somnambulist, and the sine wave syllogisms of Silicon Futures mean the same as a tossed off text or the unfiltered Instagram sun setting over Scarborough. Andre Bazin wrote of photographic ontology, the image of things is likewise the image of their duration, change mummified. Being a quarter mummy isn't so bad. It's comfortable. We are wrapped in layers upon layers of linen. Resins ab applied to the linen to keep moisture from seeping into our rotting bones. Films are at our disposal. Prescriptive and descriptive Tarkovsky time can bludgeon us until the lust of our eyes is sated at 58 minutes when the shift to color marks Stalker's arrival in the zone. Just like realizing how cinematic the loved object looks in the parquet darkness. And by the time we snip it a binaural beat to our story, she's going, going, gone. When you stop to snip it, you flee nothing less meaningful than the truth. What words and images are there for time? All beauty is ineffable. The rosewood or ballet slipper or watermelon pink dusk over Sinosphere is no more recognizable a melody than all the monads gone missing from Marion Bad to Hanging Rock. Have you heard this before? Let's return to the movies then. Like life itself, Tenet's plot can be understood on a superficial level while subconscious... Mm. While subconscious signifiers broad as color schemes and minute as palindromic dialogue hint at backwards and vor wars, deleveled once time's redivider, later called kill switch, sacristains our time Toyota's window pane into the open wounded past saieties, some of memes pending arrival that bring into being the variable future, every single dissevered, directionless, and shirking Ada Lovelace day away from the moment of vision. 
We may be getting ahead of ourselves. Some roadmen may be fouling behind. Let's ask a simple question. The antique forces bring all we've been into being. Why did Christopher Nolan break through with the rear rearward looking memento, followed by an inception of dream design, followed by interstellar revelation of time's interpersonal lawyering? The programmers contend that a temporal pincher movement pro retends and repetends in this moment we are living. We know this because we have been down in the dumbs lately. We are designing the machine that prints artificial time blocked by transactional Minkowski block. We believe faith to be the function call of the eternal. We know this because when life feels least real, like when we are in love, our psyches summon magnetic moments from the parallelogram of a passing future and a changing past to shore up an increasingly wobbly, wobbly present. Left Demosphere's dominant Max Cohen, protagonist of Pi, says evidence, the cycling of disease epidemics, the wax and wane of caribou populations, sunspot cycles, the rise and fall of the Nile. Let us attend the cycling of ideological epidemics, the cycling of egonal and epigonal epidemics, the recycling of the new sciences, the cycling of linguistic epidemics, tentpole trash getting stupider each business cycle, now the cycling of temporal epi epidemics too, once we start unboxing new centrodes for the old penitentiary, once the consequences of casualty are pre-pestered crosswords in post position. Let me tell you of a vision that I saw. With black budgeted exponential improvements in quantum computing, computer brain interfaced men will be nudged towards the temporal montages that predefine Pi's finitude. Consequently, we are in for a sequentiality of improbable possible. What stability the mystery of the primes lent us at largeness rates will come due. We'll be left to set with only idle talk, never dwelling anywhere, because world tentpole revenue can't absorb the end of philosophy and can't absolve us of the task of thinking with Bergson that it is called well-rounded because it is turned in the pure sphere of the circle, meaning sufficient computation will make even the curved line of a moral sympathy conclude itself in the eternal sphere of the circle's calculated recapitulation. La Jete tells us that other images pour out and mix. A single frame out of film, a film out of sequence is subliminal. And it's a happy face, but it's a different one. Hence the inconsequential disorientation of deja and jame and alter vus, deja vecus and deja vulus too. Because as D.A. Miller remarked, once you find a picture, it seems always to have been there staring you in the face. And once our protagonist returned to his jetty, sometimes he recaptures a happy day, but different, a happy face but different ruins. So pray for us, St. Nicholas, patron saint of repentant thieves. We simply hope to steal something back for ourselves prior to the diachronic blurring, where in Heidegger's words will seem so prescient, we'll doubt they weren't recently revised relative to the new facts on the ground. The future is not later than having been, and having been is not earlier than the present. Temporality temporizes itself as a future which makes present in a process of having been. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> A wild ride somewhere between Max G. Morton and Philip K. Dick. So I don't know if you Max Morton, but do you know that one? I uh, know, but I'll look it up. He, uh, Max, Max G. Morton, he was connected to um, the lead singer of Cold Cave. Do you know when, you, do you know when that gets published, that one? Uh, it'll probably be a couple of years. And uh, to that end, I did include my uh, email. If anyone would be interested in being a beta reader, read an early copy. I'm always looking for people to do that. So just drop me an email. And I'd be happy to send you a copy. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So because of the, the the mess up in the British summertime, uh, James Ledoux and Silas are now here. Silas, are you going to play? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Sorry, I uh, had um, yeah, it's fine. the time difference wrong. Yeah, I know. doesn't matter. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to Dr. James Simkin. That is Dr. James Simkin. In the north, position yourself. With a beer. <laughs> okay. What so do you have? Uh, what um, beer? Indian Pale Ale. Which one? Where are you? Where, why, is, why is this not working? Where? You're the speaker. You should be on speaker view. Okay, let me... I have to unmove the pin from from Mike. And now... Okay, just a second. So you'll be on... Hmm. Takes one second. Anyway. Okay, you're... 
you're in the center. Great, okay, thanks everyone. Um, and I've just stuck a copy of that up in the chat as well. <clears throat> so my um, talk this afternoon is called uh, A Secular Eschatology and thanks for Taylor for giving me the idea for that title. <clears throat> so at 5.29 a.m. Midwestern time on the 16th of July, 1945, the human race reached deep within the atomic core of nature to claw out a new and terrible God for itself. This first test use of the atomic bomb at White Sands, New Mexico, was the culmination of the increasing instrumentalization of nature, a process underway for at least the previous 200 years, emerging from the writings of Enlightenment thinkers such as Francis Bacon and René Descartes. In, my, in Martin Heidegger's controversial Der Spiegel interview of 1966, Heidegger argued that that through Enlightenment thinking, humanity had already been so thoroughly reduced to nothing more than raw materials for the fulfillment of a rational and machinic technoc technocracy, a phenomena he called technics, that only a God could save us. Taking on the form more of a lament than an argument, this short essay asserts that Heidegger's God of technics has already appeared for us today in the form of the nuclear bomb that the nuclear bomb literally takes on the godlike quality of providing the very ontic underpinning of our con continued existence by staving off world war through mutually assured destruction. Indeed, writing during the Cold War, two major figures in international relations theory, Hedley Bull and Kenneth Waltz, hoped as much. Lacking an overarching power through which belligerent nations might be brought to their senses, they argued, nuclear weapons present today supremely coercive authority, mitigating against the escalation of small conflicts into larger ones. And so in this sense, the spread of nuclear weapons was to be welcomed. What is preventing the ongoing conflict in Ukraine right now from escalating into an all out confronta confrontation between East and West, Bull and Waltz might argue, than the fear that if Russia and the NATO powers engage each other directly, it will lead to nuclear war and so on to the main argument. At the heart of the Heideggerian critique of nuclear weapons lies his general critique of technology. Although Heidegger is not opposed to, that, to technology per se, so long as it is humanity that is in control of technology and not the other way around, the problem with technology if left unchecked is that it, it all too easily begins to manifest a corrupted will to power and a desperation for grasping control. In the question, Concerning technology, Heidegger states, quote, the will to mastery becomes all the more urgent the more technology threatens to slip from human control, end quote. This will to mastery in technology comes to fruition with the nuclear bomb. Heidegger says, man stares at what the explosion of the at atom bomb can bring, bring with it, writes Heidegger in The Thing. He does not see that the atom bomb and its explosion are the mere final emission of what has long since taken place has already happened. This long since taken place, Heidegger refers, to, Heidegger refers to, is the reduction of nature to a mere resource to be exploited as an outcome of the scientistic worldview arising from the Enlightenment. Whereas Heidegger notes, nature likes to hide herself in the machine age, the possibility of all productive manufacturing lies in revealing. For Heidegger, what is lovely in nature is its poesis, which is akin to poetry. Its exuberant and beautiful ability to bring itself into being, the bursting of a blossom into bloom, as Heidegger, as Heidegger puts it. The artisan, however, then takes the poesis of nature and subjugates it to his own self fulfillment by revealing its inner workings through his manipulations. With the nuclear bomb, this subjugation of nature appears at its highest stage of develop, development in the figure of the physicist a figure who reveals the very atomic core of nature and subjects it to his control. This is what is so compelling and dangerous about science for Heidegger, its ability to reduce meaningful, meaningful things to mere objects. On the contrary, however, the nuclear bomb represents a release of energy so powerful that it re-enchants. The nuclear bomb in the age of techniques, quote, has the character of grounding as the ontic causation of the real 
as the transcendent making possible of the absolute spirit, of the historical process of production as the will to power positive values, end quote. In the face of such an outcome, only religious language can approach what needs to be said. Indeed, what, what were the reactions of those who were present at White Sands, New Mexico, to witness the birth of this new God? As Robert J. Oppenheimer, director of the Los Alamos Laboratory that designed the bomb as part of the Manhattan Project recounted, some laughed, some cried, many were silent. Yet Oppenheimer was reminded of the Hindu sacred text of the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This is the terrible temptation of the nuclear bomb, its hideous strength, as C.S. Lewis might put it, that if, as Heidegger argues, to if to, be, if to be truly human means being fully aware of our, of our mortality and the fact that we will die, the ability to be, quote, capable of death as death, then he or she who has the most power over death through the possession of nuclear weapons becomes the most human. Hence, the nuclear bomb re represents a corruption of the will to power in a delusion sense, a shift downwards from power to to power over, from puiss puissance to pouvoir. This lust for power over, this lust to power over others as represented in the nuclear bomb is also another man manifestation of Heidegger's observation that the frantic ab abolition of distance brings no nearest, nearness. Indeed, with the modern intercontinent, intercontinental ballistic missile, any spot in the world can be destroyed in minutes. Instead, modern technology has brought distanceless to dominance. How else could the destruction of millions of lives in minutes be possible than if those with the ability to launch these weapons are hidden in bunkers, to a certain extent shielded from the immediate consequence of their actions? Now on to the conclusion. Yet, in perhaps cowing mankind into a kind of terrible peace by raising a supreme power over itself through the nuclear bomb, humanity has entered into a Faustian bargain. For, man for mankind's god of techniques as presented in the nuclear bomb is not a god of order or stability, nor even a, de or nor even a demonic god, but a god more akin to H.P. Lovecraft's gods Azathoth in the short story, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, a god of blind chaos, a god devoid of reason who stumbles about club clumsily with the potential to destroy everything in its path. Thank you. Thank you, James. Getting darker and darker and darker. <laughs> is that the weather up there where you are? Or is it the, COVID is, is it the ale? Post COVID blues. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, it's a very good so far. So I have to say, as always. Um, let's. We have Nathan still, Bruce, James, and, and Silas who perform. Uh, maybe Nathan, would you like to go next? Yep. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So the topic of my work is called Accomplishing Mortality, Human Flourishing. And I will read the, I guess the introduction in the first section in a kind of cosmic humor, I guess my dad has gotten sick, so I haven't been able to finish um, a, a number of the sections, but I will read this part. So I start with, uh, three, I guess, passages or poems. One day you will look back and see that all along you were blooming. While everyone else moved on, you were firmly planted and you were growing into the one you were born to be. Morgan Nichols. The second poem is the, 
uh, by the Buddha in a from a piece called the Full Play. It's a sutra that I can't pronounce. But it says the three worlds are fleeting, like autumn clouds, like a staged performance. Beings come and go in tumultuous waves, rushing by like rapid like rapids over a cliff, like lightning. Wanderers in samsara burst into existence and are gone in a flash. Beings are ablaze with the sufferings of sickness and old age. And with no defense against the, the, the conflagurations of death, the bewildered seeking refuge in worldly existence spin round and round like bees trapped in a jar. And then the last, the, the next passage is from the way of the samurai. The way of the samurai is morning after morning, the practice of death, considering whether it will be here or be there, imagining the most sightly way of dying and putting one's mind firmly in death. Although this may be the most difficult thing, if one will do it, it can be done. There is nothing that one should suppose cannot be done. So again, the name of the talk is Accomplishing Mortality, Human Flourishing. And I start with a quote from Heidegger in the Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics. Quote, to, to accomplish means to unfold something into the fullness of his essence to lead it forth into this fullness. Therefore, only what already is can really be accomplished. Now, Heidegger says that the human being has yet to accomplish being mortal. How can that be? We as humans are all guaranteed one thing for certain, to die, are we not? <laughs> In this talk, I will attempt to show that within the modern obsession with human optimization emerges the opportunity to discover and unfold a new possibility for being human. One that allows, us, allows for us to accomplish a more authentic response to our current historical situation. Human flourishing. As Johannes states, Johannes Niederhauser states the homo humanus, the, the human human being is the mortal human being who aims to mature, who longs to be an adult, unquote. And I add to ripen or to flourish. I will also argue that human flourishing to grow into who we are is made possible only through owning death and thereby accomplishing our mortality. I will do that by first arguing that most current models of leadership and self-development are animated by an obsession with control and optimization, which is a symptom of and a natural consequence of the kind of instrumental rationality and calculative and, and, and quote calculative thinking that is given by the technological age of Gestell as the consolidation of all modes of making present. And it's forgetting of being. What stands out most about this mode of thinking is that, is, it, is that it no longer has in view death or time in their primordial sense and as such has no relationship with what it means to be fully human. I will then argue that within the sway of technicity and its danger for the human, sorry, and, and its danger for the earth and human existence remains a possibility of thinking that is more holistic and can provide a new way of being human. With this approach, we distinguish results from accomplishment and open a pathway from optimization to flourishing. I will conclude by arguing that this new way of thinking about what it means to be human can be accomplished 
only by allowing a more meditative way of thinking to emerge that is sensitive to and appreciates what makes us most unique among beings, our mortality. I will also suggest that this way of being that is made that that this way of being that is made possible by owning up authentically to our radical finitude is the accomplishment of who we most authentically are and can make way for a community of mortals that can shepherd in a new response to being and potentially save our world. And I'll just read the first section, which is the current model of leadership and self-development. So the, the current model of leadership and self-development, after being involved in the world of personal development and leadership coaching for the last 10 years, a few salient seen themes have emerged in the industry in recent years, which have provided a new challenge when working with both individuals and organizations. I will refer to it as hyper-productivity. Just last month in, the, in Success Magazine, who are now, ironically enough, pushing back against this approach, they have referred to this as the toxic hustle culture or burnout culture, where not sleeping and, wor and, and, and working oneself until, you're, until their body collapses is championed as a sort of heroic superpower. Within this approach, which strives for maximum efficiency, prior the the prioritization of production over well-being, the value of things and even individuals, a human being, is something that is measured by external production and then assigned to beings. Value, in other words, is not inherent or coming from things themselves, but it is given by man. This will to optim optimization, the will to will, the will to control, or what I'm calling the human optimization movement is characterized by the measurement of data and results only. And the goal, like transhumanism, is to transcend the limitations of our human finitude and to be like the penultimate God of perfection in the metaphysical sense, where nothing is hidden, missing, or out of place. Omnipotent. Um, 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 <laughs> omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and fully present at all times and everywhere all at once. With this obsession with hyper-effectiveness and efficiency, human value is determined by its, product, by its productiveness or the value that it adds. Think of the movie Limitless, where Bradley Cooper, who plays the character Edward Mora, a 28-year-old struggling writer who uses a, new, a magic nootropic pill, unlocks 100% of his brain's capacity and becomes godlike, intellectually and physically. The movie was released after an epidemic of kids and teenagers and college students were being prescribed Adderall, which is an amphetamine salt, to promote hyper-focus in order to become more. This is the ultimate focus, to be more, more smart, more motivated, more focused more effective, more successful, and ultimately more valuable. The point of these observations is not to stand on a soapbox and moralize about the way that things should be, or a, remote, or, or a romantic desire for a return to a previous era, or even to vilify the way that it is, right? There's nothing wrong with technological thinking or gestell. In this, it is the modern way that being has revealed itself to us and you cannot alter something by resisting it. The point is to bring into view some unthematized basic presuppositions at play within this perspective and to bring them to light so that we can, one, consider any as yet unforeseen impacts of this way of being. Two, preserve what works out, sorry, preserve what works out about the technological revealing of beings or tech -like. And third, face up to, and potentially deal with the impact authentically to gain what Heidegger calls a free relationship with technology in a way that something new can emerge.
So that's what I have fully worked out so far, and the rest is very good. Working. Out. Thank you, Nathan. Keep keep writing that, please. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, also, feel free to to send it over, like everybody else, also to so have a look at it. Silas, we need some we need some music. I think. Are you going to play live, or are you going to show the recording? I'm gonna I'm gonna play live. Um, I've got my keyboard set up here. Um, I want to apologize to everybody for being late. I had the time wrong. I really like everybody's mm -hmm. ideas that I've heard so far, and I want to go back and hear everything I missed before. Um, but yeah, this is just a brief little song called Electricity. Um, I asked, <laughs> I, Johannes is laughing because I asked him, you know, if you, I know you want to keep this assignment open ended, but I'd appreciate if I could have some kind of direction. He said, well, why don't you write about uh, your understanding of electricity? And so I yeah. called the song Electricity um, and uh, just tried to kind of leave some room for interpretation, not make it uh, super wordy, but, uh, kind of just hint at the uh, ideas a little poetically, but also uh, um, have also have a clear idea of saying something as well. So it's a, I quote, um, have a little spoken word thing at the end where I quote uh, the Old Testament book of Job specifically. And then I add a little thing on there about um, uh, with using some Heidegger uh, language as well. So both together. Um, but yeah, Good. so... I can it's go. Is that coming through okay? Yeah, that's very good. And what's your band's okay. name? Let, what's your uh, band name? Yeah, so yeah. the band's name is Blue Salt coming out. Uh, we actually should, we are going to actually sending off our uh, upcoming album to be mixed right now. So that's in the yeah. last stages. So we're very excited about that. Um, but we have one album out now called Midnight that was a uh, year before COVID that came out. And so we're got this... Uh, new one coming out pretty soon probably in may excellent so, yeah this is electricity electricity can't tell you what it means Electricity can't tell you what it means. But every time my heart beats, I feel closer to you. I do. It's just an image that I see before me. It ain't you. Than we were before. It's like I can't see you anymore. No more. Well, I don't know where the current flows go somewhere else as we pass the time. There's something flowing through us. It's like we hardly knew us. Well, something's changed and something's wrong. I can't deny it. We're like a ship without a captain. Who knows what'll happen? Who knows what'll happen? Oh, complacency. Don't feel too safe to me. This complacency. Don't feel too safe to me. deep things of darkness and brings utter darkness into the light. 
from the realm of the unconcealed, the undefined, what is yet unknown. Thank you, Sans. Thank you. Excellent. I think what we should do, we should try and do, you know what, is record this if you want. I mean, this is an offer. Sure. Um, again, and then we can put it out as a video or so if you want. Cool, cool. Um, Perfect. Yeah. That's the first demo. Yeah. We'll, if you send me a video we'll, with some images or something, we we'll put it out as well. Link to your band. Awesome. Your record Thank comes you. out. Blue Salt. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Blue salt. Very good. Thank you, Silas. Okay. Uh, last but not least is James Ladouf. And then we can have a discussion afterwards. If you have questions for anyone, just ask a question afterwards. James. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Sorry. The, uh, the, hopefully the internet is stable enough. Um, so again, sorry for, uh, for showing up late. Um, I'll definitely be going back to uh, listen to the recording again. All right, so my, um, my essay is, um, my short essay is entitled Intimations of Gestel in the work of René Guinon. René Guinon was a French perennialist philosopher living at the same time as Heidegger. Although Guinon spoke mostly in terms of geometric and traditional re religious symbolism, usually that of Hinduism and the Abrahamic religions, much of what he discusses concerning the development of the modern world fits quite nicely with Heidegger's thought on technology. In particular, I will discuss Guinon's work, The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times, first published in 1945, and point to how this work complements that of Heidegger. For today, I'd like to view Guinon's scheme for thinking as a vertical line segment with the top fold denoting the quality or qualitative aspects of reality and the bottom fold denoting quantity. For Guinon, this is the modern manifestation of the essence and substance duality of the ancient world. This can be considered a sort of degeneration or reification in the sense that, in essence, synthesizes the attributes that belong to a being to make it what it is, while equality, while equality is more or less synonymous with one of those attributes. Quality can be seen roughly as the content of essence. Substance in the traditional sense is pure potency or potentiality and can be said to be purely unintelligible. Quinon sees the fundamental tendency of the modern world as movement towards, but never fully reaching, the quantitative pull of, uh, of the schematic. This movement, referred to as the reign of quantity, occurs as a reduction of all beings to the quantitative by ignoring quality altogether. Quinon sees the first clear instantiation of this in the mechanistic physics that follow from the Cartesian thought. Modern physics studies matter as the fundam fundamental building blocks of reality. The matter of modern physics, however, is not the pure substance of, uh, of the ancients because there is always still, in some sense, some intelligibility to it. This intelligibility is of a quantitative nature. There's almost no quality to the particles of physics since they can only be studied or understood by calculating mass, momentum, charge, position, etc., to greater and greater precision. In this way, a reduction of quality to quantity assigns all reality to matter. With reference to the Cartesian coordinate system, Guinon claims that conceiving extension as only quantitative leads to conceiving of space as entirely homogeneous, hence space as a container without any contents. This is reminiscent of how Heidegger talks about space and its reduction to measured extension and space conceptualized as a container in building dwelling thinking. For Guinon, the presence of bodies in the space suffices to determine qualitative differences between parts or different points in space. But since Descartes reduces the nature of bodies to quantitative extension, he must suppose that the presence of those bodies adds nothing to what space itself already is. To continue to point back to the quality of space, Quinone draws attention to how there's not just the extension of bodies, but also their situatedness. It is not that the world or things are in space, but that space is in the world. The quality of the space is dependent on that structure which provides the opening of that space. Um, such a space that arises through the structure of the jug that Heidegger refers to in the thing. Similarly, in a similar way, Guinon talks about how periods of time are qualitatively different by the events that unfold within them. 
One important effect of this reduction to quantity, which is already hinted at in the discussion of how modern physics treats all particles of the same species as identical, and all of space and time as homogeneous, is the uniformization of the world. The beings under consideration become separate individuals in a quantitative multiplicity, where the unity is found only in the precise uniformity of the individuals. There's no gathering together into a cohesive whole, no logos, but rather a placing in ever more precisely calculable arrangements. Although Guidon did not conceptualize the essence of technology as in framing, as Heidegger did, he did recognize the ordering of the world, including man himself, as a calculated standing reserve within mechanization. So for Guidon at the time, machines represented in the highest degree the predominance of quantity over quality. He even sees the engendering of a state of affairs where everything is counted, recorded, and regulated as another kind of mechanization. Quote, is not modern man having mechanized the world around him, doing his very best to mechanize himself in all the forms of activity that still remain open to his narrowly limited nature? In keeping with Heidegger's notion of gestell or in framing, Guinon remarks that the reduction to uniformity includes human beings themselves as well as the things among which they live. This tendency is also seen in democratic and egalitarian political tendencies that view all individuals as equal. But this carries with it the idea that all individuals are equally well fitted for anything whatsoever, i.e. are interchangeable parts, particularly in the production of goods. The uniformity is also encouraged, for example, in imposed uniform education. It is, in, it is even seen in the common sense notion of the idea of ordinary life, which is stripped of all sacred, ritual, and symbolic aspects. Guinot also had intimations of the concealing aspect of Gestell. Quote, it can be said that the truth that certain aspects of reality conceal, it can be said with truth that certain aspects of reality conceal themselves from anyone who looks upon reality from a pro profane and materialistic point of view and they become inaccessible to his observation. In closing, it's, I would argue that um, perhaps as a result of the time they lived in, both Guinon and Heidegger, Heidegger were attuned to the grip of Gestell tightening on the Western world. The different approaches to drawing attention to this grip complement each other in many ways. Personally, what I noticed, um, maybe this is a, a preference, is that Heidegger sometimes, um, his cryptic use of language and the interplay between the analytic and poetic do a much better job of leading one to actually see a way outside of this maybe subject object, um, you know, and say more quantitative motive uh, uh, thinking and seeing um, than the more analytic slash symbolic approach of, uh, of Guinon. Okay. Excellent, Mr. Laduce, thank you very much. Uh, very briefly on the symbolic in Heidegger, anyone who's interested, he has a few things to say on this in the essay on the, oh, sorry, Ursprung des Kunstwerks, so origin of the artwork. He mentions the symbol quite at the beginning and why art to him is not symbolic. So anyone who's interested in that can read that essay. All right. That would be it in terms of official speakers. Thank you all very much.